recording. So welcome everybody to this webinar uh, in which we'll be preparing and working together with you to prepare for the voluntary national reviews at the 2023 High Level Political Forum, the HLPF. Um, my name's Oli Henman. I'm one of the organizing partners of the NGO Major Group, and I helped to uh, convene the uh, VNR Task Group in the Major Groups and other stakeholders. And I'm delighted that we're joined by Tonya Vaturi from uh, UNDESA, the Department for Economic and Social Affairs, who's been a great ally to us uh, in civil society, helping, helping to open the doors to greater participation of stakeholders at the HLPF. Um, so to get us started, um, I'd like to pass over to Tonya um, and she'll guide us through the steps um, over the coming months that will get you ready for the HLPF. And then we'll hear a little bit more about how the major groups can help to support you. And then finally, we'll have time for questions and answers. So let me pass over to Tonya, over to you. Thank you, Oli, and thank you to the VNR task group of the major groups and other stakeholders coordination mechanism for convening this webinar and for inviting you and DESA's collaboration. I'm with the Office of Intergovernmental Support and Coordination for Sustainable Development. So we provide substantive support to the high level political forum on sustainable development. We also guide member states in preparing and presenting their voluntary national reviews and we support the major groups and other stakeholders in their role as key actors in implementation. As many of you know, the Voluntary National Review is a comprehensive exercise that UN member states are encouraged to undertake in their efforts to monitor and evaluate national implementation of the 2030 Agenda and its sustainable development goals. So for my part of this presentation, I'm gonna briefly review some of the key mandates and established practices for the VNRs and show you where to find important timelines and resources related to the VNRs and the HLPF this year. My colleague, Ali, will then provide some guidance on how we can bring the voices of civil society into the process of presenting the VNRs at the HLPF. So first, a bit of history on the VNRs and how we got here. In 2015, the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development by the UN General Assembly ushered in a new era for development. It defined a transformative vision, a plan of action for people, planet, and prosperity, as is stated in the first line of the preamble. It's an agenda of unprecedented scope and significance accepted by all countries and applicable to all, taking into account different national realities, capacities, and levels of development, and respecting national policies and priorities. It includes universal goals and targets which involve the entire world, both developed and developing countries. And in this way, it's a very unique uh, agreement. The goals and targets are integrated and indivisible and balance the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. The goals and targets are the result of over two years of intensive public consultation and engagement with civil society and other stakeholders around the world, which paid particular attention to the voices of the poorest and the most vulnerable. In all these respects, it's a very ambitious and visionary global agenda, and it pledges to leave no one behind. And apart from defining the SDGs, the 2030 agenda also addresses the follow-up and review process at the national, regional, and global levels. So paragraph 79 of the 2030 agenda encourages member states to conduct regular and inclusive reviews of progress at the national and subnational levels, which are country led and country driven. It states that such reviews should draw on contributions from indigenous peoples, civil society, the private sector, and other stakeholders in line with national circumstances, policies, and priorities. National parliaments, as well as other institutions can also support these processes. So the 2030 agenda also addresses follow-up and review at the global level in line with General Assembly Resolution 67 290, which defined the high level political forum on sustainable development as the central UN platform for reviewing progress towards the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. Paragraph 84 of the 2030 Agenda calls on the HLPF held every year, excuse me, under the auspices of ECOSOC uh, 
to carry out regular reviews of progress that include stakeholders and civil society, including the private sector. So next slide, please. The principles are defined as state-led involving ministerial and other relevant high-level participants that provide a platform for partnerships, including through the participation of major groups and other stakeholders. So this slide summarizes paragraph 74 of the 2030 agenda, which defined the principles that should guide the follow-up and review process at all levels, including through the VNRs, which they are voluntary to encourage reporting and involve both developed and developing countries. They are state-led and country-driven reviews of progress at both national and subnational levels, that they provide a platform for partnerships, including through the participation of major groups and other relevant stakeholders, that they constitute a learning experience and facilitate the sharing of experiences, including successes, challenges, and lessons learned as part of the review process. And they're prepared in accordance with national circumstances, policies, and priorities together with relevant partners. Finally, the process is also open, inclusive, and transparent, and should facilitate communication with all stakeholders. Next slide. So this year, the HLPF will convene from the 10th to the 19th of July in 2023. The VNR presentations are expected to be in the program from Friday the 14th and then Monday through uh, Wednesday, 17th through 19th of July. The theme of the HLPF this year is accelerating the recovery from COVID-19 and the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development at all levels. This theme I think is in keeping with the last few years since we've been um, dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. This theme is very similar from the last couple of years, but I think it's looking ahead to in how are we going to reach 2030 and what are the, the transformative actions that are needed now uh, with the 2030 agenda and the SDGs as the blueprint print for recovery from the pandemic. Um, but also at, every year the HLPF reviews a cluster of goals. This year, the SDGs under review include goal six on clean water and sanitation, seven on affordable and clean energy, SDG nine on industry, innovation and infrastructure, SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities and SDG 17 on partnerships for the goals which is reviewed every year. Now the VNRs, we encourage countries every year to report on all of the SDGs and not just the goals that are under review. So we usually try to emphasize that to avoid confusion um, because while the HLPF thematic review sessions will address these goals and look at progress, they don't discount the interconnected nature of all the SDGs. And so with the VNRs, it's the same. The, the VNRs may be structured according to national priorities. Some countries may prioritize some goals and not so much on others, but all of the goals as we know are interconnected and the targets can be clustered in a way that shows uh, transformative pathways amongst the goals. So finally, with the HLPF this year, we want to let you know that the format will probably be in-person only. And this is due to the nature of headquarters and all of the different aspects that must be involved in having sort of a hybrid event. Um, it is much more difficult to do that for the HLPF than it is for, let's say, regional forums or other types of expert group meetings. But we will keep you informed if there's any opportunity uh, for remote participation. At this time, it will probably be that we would encourage everyone to please try and come in person. And I'd like to just add that in the Secretariat, we are working now to hopefully open registration early for those who would like to participate in person so that you can receive an, a formal invitation letter and hopefully get um, the required visas if necessary with plenty of time to spare. I know that's been a challenge in the last year. When we came back in person last year, it was difficult for most people to come in person. However, we always do have a live broadcast of the HLPF. So the webcast is accessible to anyone 
You don't even have to register. So if you're interested to participate virtually or to listen in, you can always do that. For those who want to come in person, I would highly encourage you to work with us and make sure that, uh, you know, that we can help you if needed. Okay, so the next slide, please. So this is just a little bit of stats on the VNRs. So over seven years now, we've had almost every country present at least one VNR. And after July of this year, 189 countries, including, well, as well as the EU region, will have presented over 300 reports during the HLPF. And here you just see a listing of the number of VNRs that were presented each year uh, up until this year. So this year, 41 presenters will carry out VNRs. And I think the next slide, if we go to the next one. Yes, this is the list of all countries that will be presenting this year and showing you also the regional breakdown, which I think this year seems to be rather balanced. Um, you can also see under Europe that we have the European Union, which is a new type of entity. They are reporting as a region. Um, and they're reporting for the first time, uh, along with St. Kitts and Nevis, a SIDS country that will be presenting their first VNR. And then we have one country, Chile, who's going to be presenting for the third time. Apart from that, every other country in this list will be presenting a second VNR. So this is really unique too. After seven years of reporting, we can see that we're nearing universal reporting and we really like to see the way that the VNRs are showing progression, um, the comparability and the compatibility of the reports is something that is helpful for not only for the secretariat, for member states within the forum, but also for anyone around the world to look at the progress that's being made, to learn from each other, um, and to decide where the challenges can be met and where some of the goals may remain aspirational. Because as you know, we, we really have not made as much progress as has been hoped. But the VNRs are still important. We, we still want to take stock of what countries are doing and especially the ways that they're engaging major groups and other stakeholders, not only in the work of implementation, but in the preparation of these voluntary national reviews. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Right, so I, I apologize because the type on this slide is probably very difficult to read. But just to know that this is a timeline for the 2023 HLPF, as well as the SDG summit coming up in September, which is every four years, the high level political forum is convened under the auspices of the General Assembly, as well as under ECOSOC. So the SDG summit is really sort of the HLPF at a higher level. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But this timeline shows you uh, many of the relevant processes and events leading up to the HLPF and onward to the summit. Um, and this timeline is on the HLPF website. So if you go to the HLPF website, you will find this timeline and you will be able to zoom in on it and see um, all of the different relevant events. But I'd like to just highlight a couple of key dates on this timeline with regard to the VNRs. Um, on May 3rd is the deadline for all member states to submit their key messages to the secretariat. The main messages of the VNRs are sort of an executive summary. They are compiled together in an official document um, so that member states and others can have a preview of what the VNRs are going to focus on at the HLPF. And this is a very useful way to kind of get an overview of, of what countries are going to be presenting. Uh, the second deadline that's very important is the 9th of June this year is when the full reports are due. And then the 16th of June is the deadline for audiovisual materials that are going to be presented in connection with the voluntary national review at the HLPF. Um, I think that's it. So let's move on to the next slide. This slide shows you the modalities for the VNRs at the HLPF. 
So, you know, we only have a couple of first time presenters this year. Uh, first time presenters generally get a little bit more time than the second time presenters. That's the main difference. Um, so let's look at the modalities for second and third time presenters, because this is really what the bulk of the VNRs uh, are going to be this year. So these countries will have about 10 minutes for a virtual presentation in a panel format, followed by a similar amount of time for questions from other countries and from stakeholders. And this is the opportunity that Ollie will be discussing a little bit more with you, but it's really important because uh, the, the VNR presentations at the HLPF, they, they constitute not only the presentations themselves, but a discussion around what is being done on the ground. And when we can include the groups of stakeholders that have been engaged in the process at the HLPF, it lends not only an air of legitimacy to the VNR itself, but it helps other groups to understand how they can also get involved in their countries. Um, it's been really an important part of the HLPF and many member states have expressed their appreciation for the role that major groups and other stakeholders play in these panels. Um, so the rules around the participation are rather strict. Major groups and other stakeholders can nominate one speaker to pose a question to each of the countries presenting a VNR once the presentations are complete. And then there may be some back and forth um, often we encourage the member states to fully answer each of these questions. And sometimes if there isn't sufficient time, because the challenge always is the time constraint. And this is very frustrating for everyone, um, but to keep within the time limits is probably the most important advice that can be given because it's, it's really unfortunate when there's a wonderful intervention that has to be cut off. And generally, the chairs of the VNR sessions, as well as other sessions, can be pretty strict with cutting the microphone. So if you are participating in a VNR session and you have the opportunity to raise a question to a member state, it's really, really important to keep that question and that intervention within the time limits, which is usually only a couple of minutes. So let's move on to the next slide. I have a couple more and then I'll hand it over to you, Ali. But this is a slide that we wanna um, just highlight the repository of resources that are available to guide you in understanding how you can get involved. What are the VNRs? What is the process in detail? Um, we have direct links to some of these, which include the latest handbook for 2023. And within that handbook, are the Secretary General's Voluntary Common Reporting Guidelines for VNRs. This is really the, the main resource that we use and that member states use in preparing their VNRs. And you're probably familiar with it. We've just updated the cover a little bit uh, this year, but every year we update it as well as we can. And it includes a lot of really good examples. So I encourage everyone, if you're not familiar with the VNRs, to have a look at the handbook and the guidelines. Um, in connection with that, uh, we also have the virtual knowledge exchange on approaches and tools for the VNRs. This was compiled this year in connection with some of the global VNR workshops that we've done. And this is also a really important resource for stakeholders to understand some of the different uh, activities that happen around the VNRs and how you can learn and exchange the knowledge that you have with your colleagues. Um, of course, we have the database of all the VNRs on our website, and we have this new repository of tools and practices and lessons learned, um, which we just keep collecting those. And if you, if you know of one that doesn't exist there, please let us know so that we can include it. Um, we have the synthesis report, which is sort of um, an overview of some of the best practices and examples of initiatives that were identified in the 2022 VNRs. And then here we also have a framework to analyze stakeholder engagement and implementation and follow up of the 2030 agenda. So these are some of the key publications that are linked here in this presentation that you can find on our website. And with that, we go to the next slide. Thank you, Ali. 
And this final slide from my part is just to note that, you know, we have some basic information here on the SDG summit that will be convened in September that I mentioned earlier. It's important just because, you know, the HLPF is going to be building up to that summit. It's, it's held to uh, provide a platform to launch some of the initiatives and some of the, the key messages that will be transferred to the summit in September. Um, so this is where heads of state and government will gather at the UN headquarters in New York to follow up and review the implementation of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs and take stock of where we stand. This summit happens every four years, as I mentioned earlier, but this particular summit marks the midway point um, between 2015 when the agenda was adopted and 2030. So in this summit, there will be a comprehensive review of the state of the SDGs. Um, the summit will also aim to respond to the impact of the multiple and interlocking crises facing the world and provide high level political guidance on transformative and accelerated actions leading up to the target year of 2030. It will be chaired by the president of the General Assembly and the outcome will be a negotiated political declaration, which is currently, uh, there are currently informals happening being co-facilitated by the permanent representatives of Ireland and Qatar. And this will be um, also an opportunity to bring together political and thought leaders, not only from governments, but from international organizations and the private sector, as well as civil society. And we really wanna emphasize the presence and the voices of women and youth, indigenous people and others. And there will be a series of high level meetings with heads of state and government. Um, there will be special events and other high level events around the summit. And we will definitely look forward to working with all of you closely as we move through all of these milestones of this year. So I just want to conclude by emphasizing that UNDESA is here to support and guide you in preparing and presenting VNRs and working with member states in this regard. So thanks a lot. And I'll pass the floor back to Ali, who will uh, carry on with explaining how you can become more involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I think you've covered so much uh, useful material. I can see in the chat that many people are very appreciative of your time and your commitment to opening the doors for uh, civil society to be able to participate in these key processes. Um, and for those who are joining us, um, please do continue to put your comments in the chat. Um, and then once uh, we've completed the presentations, we'll also uh, give the chance for those who might want to ask a question. You'll be able to do that using the hand raise function, um, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, so to complete the picture um, from the point of view of the major groups and other stakeholders, um, I'm just going to give you a few additional slides. Um, and some of you on this call, I'm sure, will be familiar with the process. Um, as you've already heard from Tonya, um, there is a, a kind of uh, a, a, a recognition within the UN framework that uh, major groups and other stakeholders should have a role to play both in the drafting of the VNRs and in the actual presentation and being able to raise a question um, at the HLPF is, is one of those key moments and key opportunities for us to engage. So just to give a little bit of background um, in case you're not familiar and again I'm sure most of you on this call will already um, be, be very aware, but there were the um, initially nine major groups that were agreed back uh, at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 that included uh, NGOs, but also indigenous peoples, farmers, children and youth, uh, women, workers and trade unions, um, the business and industry major group, local authorities, uh, scientific and technological com uh, community as well. Um, but those nine were then expanded um, in 2015 to include a number of additional stakeholder groups that were also recognized as playing a key role um, as the new agenda was agreed in 2015. And that included persons with disabilities, uh, aging, education, academia, financing for development, uh, volunteers, LGBTIQ, 
um, the communities uh, discriminated on the basis of work and descent, as well as some of the regional groupings that have formed to help to bring together civil society and, and stakeholders in each of the different regions um, and alongside the regional forums which are coming up. So we hope you have already been engaging through your various um, uh, constituency group. Um, it's a self-organized space. As you know, each of us um, join um, the groups that make most sense to us and those groups themselves are organized in an open and inclusive way. Um, for example, in the NGO Mage group, which I'm most active with, we have regular meetings where we identify different speakers from across the membership and we also give people opportunities to feed into the uh, official dra uh, the drafting of official responses to the um, the BNRs and also to the wider uh, statements that come out during the HLPF, including this year the political declaration which uh, Tonya just mentioned that will be linked to the SDG summit. Um, so in order to help to coordinate that activity, there is a coordination mechanism um, and a number of us are part of that coordination mechanism and within the coordination mechanism there are different task groups um, and I help to organize the task group on the VNRs. So if there's anything more we can provide you with, please do reach out to me after this call and we can make sure if you're not yet in touch with one of those key um, constituency groups, we can make sure to link you up with the most relevant one. Um, what do we have in terms of rights, if you like, that are recognized by the UN? Um, I think Tonya has already highlighted that there was uh, a key resolution that established the a high level political forum, um, the resolution at the UN General Assembly 67290, which recognizes the rights of these key major groups and other stakeholders to be able to participate. And that includes a number of uh, opportunities to be able to attend the meetings of the forum. And that's what we're preparing for now ahead of July to attend the preparatory meetings, and that includes the regional forums, which actually start next week already. As many of you will know, the Africa Regional Forum is next week, um, which will be followed by the Arab region, and then Asia Pacific and Europe, and then finally Latin America in April. Um, we have the um, recognition that there should be the opportunity to intervene and speak at each of these official meetings to submit documents on behalf of each of our stakeholder groups, um, as well as to be able to present uh, written and oral contributions to be able to speak um, after each of the member states um, and to make recommendations that can then be taken on board as part of the discussions at the HLPF. And finally, to organize our own side events and roundtables. Um, and I believe that will also come up later in April, May, um, as we get closer to the HLPF. So in order to help to bring voices from such a broad and diverse range of stakeholders, um, we make it as uh, accessible and as open as we can to try to gather inputs and interest um, through this expression of interest that we've circulated widely since December. And the idea is that there should be a process that is really driven by those of you who are active within each of the countries that are under review in the VNR this year. And so it's really an opportunity for you to bring national issues that are important to civil society actors within the VNR country um, and to work together to come up with a joint statement that reflects um, the views that have come across from different stakeholders within that country. It's important to note that the statements that are then presented are a collaboration. They don't reflect one single a group, they don't reflect one single NGO, they're really designed to be a collaborative effort um, and that it's essential that we all uh, respect the human rights principles and gender equality um, to ensure that when we do have those statements that they reflect um, the diversity of views within the country. Um, and we as the, as the coordination mechanism and as the VNR task group, we help to try to ensure that those principles are being followed and that there is uh, gender parity in the speakers as well. Um, the statements then are delivered on behalf of those of you who've been working together on the statement in that country. Um, and the idea is that they should um, highlight some cross-cutting issues, 
um, and also raise a question to the member states um, to, to consider in, uh, in light of their VNR. So the steps that we'd recommend over the coming months will be um, that there may already be opportunities underway for inputs at the country level. I'm sure some of you already have been in touch with your governments, perhaps even since uh, October, November of last year, to input into the official VNR drafting that is already ongoing in many countries. Um, secondly, we expect within the coming months that most governments will then share the draft of their VNR with you in some format. Um, that may be that they run a consultation process. It may be that they have an online process. It may be that they have a physical meeting with ministers um, to discuss um, the initial draft of the VNR. Um, we know that when the governments then come to the HLPF in July, um, there are some uh, member states that choose to bring uh, civil society groups or stakeholder groups as part of the official delegation. Um, I mean, Denmark did this, for example, um, and I think also Finland, and they've actually had stakeholders presenting alongside the government. So that, that may happen, um, but that's separate from our own process as, as stakeholder groups. Um, we also will have the right for someone to speak um, separate to the government afterwards. Um, and so it's important to see how that process uh, plays out within your country. If you have been able to be involved in the dialogue um, and if, if you're still looking at how to engage that, please do let us know. It might be that we can put you in touch with others in the country who are already active through a network or through a coalition on the SDGs who can then help you to, um, to be engaged um, in that country level discussion. So from our side though, um, what can we do to help you to bring your voice into the HLPF itself in July? Um, as I mentioned, there's already um, a call for expressions of interest, which has been live since December, and we'll make sure to circulate that again after this call. Um, please do fill in the survey. It asks for just a few uh, details about your particular group and any um, ideas that you may have that you want to share uh, ready for the VNR statement. Um, we're aiming to conclude that uh, initial expression of interest by the end of February, so by next week. Um, and we have webinars today, um, tomorrow and Tuesday. Tomorrow it'll be in French and on Tuesday in Spanish. Um, once we've concluded this process of um, of ensuring that we gather the expressions of interest, we will then identify uh, ways to connect you in each country into small clusters of volunteers who are active in their country who would then want to work together as a country team to draft a statement. And you'll be supported in that work by one of the VNR task group members who will help you to come together and start to draft your statement. Um, the idea is you might already want to do uh, a meeting alongside the regional uh, sustainable development forums, which are happening, as I said, in the coming weeks. And nevertheless, we imagine that most of the drafting will happen online virtually um, over the coming months from March through to May, whereby you can have a collaboration and a dialogue within your country with those who are active. And you would then prepare your own independent uh, statement with a question that would then be asked um, at, the, at the HLPF. Um, it will be important also that you have a process within each of those uh, groups, within each country, to then select a person to be your spokesperson who will then read out the short statement in question. Um, as Tonya has said, it's normally only two minutes uh, that we have for that statement. Um, so you would then need to decide who the person would be. And again, to remember that the person who speaks is not speaking on behalf of their own organization, but rather to reflect um, the statement that's been agreed as a group. And so they would read that agreed statement out um, at the HLPF. So, so finally, just to give you a, a sense of some of the uh, ways of working um, that we'll be aiming to, to continue with this year, one of the, the main aims um, really is to, is to get to the point of preparing a joint statement that can then be presented at the HLPF. We, we do expect most of that to happen through 
uh, remote collaboration. So then they will be a Google Doc, for example, and then they will be calls whereby each of you can uh, input into a joint statement. Um, and we think it's crucial to engage as many um, different actors and stakeholders and constituency groups in each country as possible. Um, it'll be it'll be down to, as I said, the whoever the focal point from the VNR task group um, who's who's working with you to help to make those connections and to introduce people to make sure that you know who else is active in the country. Um, we have to be careful with the confidentiality of the database, so we can't open the list to everyone. But what you'll what you'll receive is a contact from the focal point in the task group, and that person will link you up with others who are active in the country uh, and will make sure that then you have the chance to work together to develop that statement um, over a number of weeks. Um, throughout this process, we'll be liaising closely with the UN Secretariat. As you've already heard from, from Tanya, we do have a close uh, working relationship and we'll make sure that any information that's coming out in terms of official registration and process for uh, arranging um, access to the UN is made available as soon as as soon as we receive it. Um, so I think um, I just had one last slide which gives you some helpful links and again we'll put this in the email but you can find the links. We actually have a new website now specifically for the major groups and other stakeholders which also includes the examples of last year's statement so you can have a look at what was uh, raised by um, the stakeholder groups last year. Um, and of course, there's the very um, dynamic new website that's been developed by the UN uh, for the HLPF. Um, and that website also includes the full list of all VNR countries going back to 2016. So you can look through that and you can see uh, what countries have said in previous VNRs as well to help you to prepare for your for your statement. Um, and please do let us know if you'd like to be added to uh, the mailing lists. Um, there is a, a major groups and other stakeholders mailing list, so we can make sure that you receive any further information that way. So I think those are our main slides for today. Um, and at this point, I'd just like to see if anyone would like to come forward with a question or if there are comments. I do see there are quite a number of comments requesting the information in the chat. And we'll make sure that we do share the links to all of the information that you've seen today, including um, the very useful handbooks and uh, toolkits that Tonya shared, as well as the um, survey that I've just mentioned. Um, and I'll put that in the chat shortly. Um, I think we did have a hand raise from, from Isha. Isha, would you like to come in, uh, you should be able to unmute your mic now. Please go ahead, Isha. Yeah, uh, my, my question to Audi and to Tonya, and thanks for your presentation. Number one is still we are uh, CSO timeline is two minutes. Is that uh, still we are stand with the two minutes? Uh, and I, I want to know whether there's any way you can find an increase of the timeline. Two minutes is very short. Uh, the next question is, is there any possible whoever participating as a major groups can have a side event with selective VNR presenters because the two minutes it's you cannot do anything just waste of time basically but the side event if you have it there's a time that we can discuss further on the VNR and and you can see the lesson learns and everything that is what I want to ask you thank you Thanks, Isha. Um, Tonya, perhaps you might answer that. The, the question about whether it's possible to extend the time and also about the side events, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Isha, for your question. Thanks, Ali. Um, it is true that two minutes is really not a lot of time to make a statement. So what we advocate, because you know the, the purpose of constraining the time is so that everyone does get a chance to speak. Um, I would just highly recommend that you use those two minutes to pose a question to the member state um, based on the VNR and also to just make something that is a, a statement that's very concise, very focused, a question or a data point or a fact to not go on about what your organization does on the ground, et cetera. 
the side event is a great idea. And I'm glad you brought that up because there are numerous other opportunities outside of the spotlight of being behind the microphone during the session on the VNRs. Of course, there are many, many other opportunities for you to interact. And this is one reason why we really do prefer in-person participation. You have the opportunity to have discussions with others in the corridors, to have bilateral meetings, et cetera. And side events are an opportunity where people can discover more in depth some of the commonalities or some of the initiatives that are working for them to, to do peer exchange, peer learning and exchanges of experiences. And we do have hundreds of side events literally at the HLPF every year. So if you are working with a member state, I would advise you to talk to them about um, applying for a side event. Uh, there will be an opportunity to request a side event. So if you're working with a coalition of other stakeholders, or with the government uh, who's preparing the VNR, um, you can apply to host a side event. And that's where you can have more in-depth conversations. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, yeah. thanks. Thanks a lot, yeah. I think only you can organize a side event on behalf of. Right, yeah. I mean, yeah. we'll certainly be looking at opportunities for side events. I think that's a really good point. Um, yeah. And as soon as we, you know, have that um, open call for side events, we'll make sure to circulate it. And we'll also look at doing some joint ones as the NGO major group. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's very important. Yeah, because especially on the monitoring side, the evaluation side, having a VNR, we can actually can get to listen, learn and learn from each other so that is very important otherwise we just come we make a statement doesn't make any sense at the end Thanks. um if, if i may also just add that the the vnr process is really a, a year-round process it's ongoing so the hlpf represents the pinnacle point where globally uh, some of the key messages are shared but after the hlpf uh, many countries have found that it's useful to go back to their capitals to their communities especially and share the, the report. And this is another area and an opportunity where stakeholders on the ground, if they maybe cannot come to New York, should be engaged in following up with their uh, various ministries or those focal points who are involved in preparing and presenting the VNR to see how they can engage even after the presentation at the HLPF. And with the hope, I think, in the years going forward that the VNR becomes a year round activity that can be conducted every year by countries who are interested to do so and who have the motivation and the, the stakeholders are, are very excited to work together and continue that work beyond the HLPF. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, thanks. Great points, very good points. And yes, it is a, an ongoing process where we also hope that we can help to keep you in touch. And once you make contact with others who are active in your country and with the government uh, team that might be driving this forward that you could uh, take uh, you know, further steps after the VNR to make sure that the principles and the uh, aims that are shared at the HLPF are then embedded in, in national policy. Um, great, I can see we've got two or three other hands raised now, um, which is excellent. And I can see there's also a question about the regional forums. I'll, I'll post the dates in the, in the chat right now. Um, let's go next to, I, the next hand I see is Edwin um, and then Sylvia. Uh, Edwin, you should be able to unmute now. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your brilliant presentations. It's really informative. Uh, the first thing I want to make is to request for toolkits that gives a clear picture of what VNR is, the principles, underlying principles, and the other information that we stakeholders are supposed to know before we engage fully in the forthcoming uh, programs. Again, if I heard you very well, I heard you talking about uh, expression of interests Said, uh, very soon you're going to receive the calls for expression of interest uh, such that uh, parties that would want to participate in the VNR process would apply and subsequently be uh, invited to participate in person in those programs. I would uh, love to 
have clarification on that. Is it what I have understood or it is something different from that? And how do we go around that? Thanks. Great, I think probably those are questions that, that I could answer. The, the first one on the toolkits, that's a really good suggestion. We, we do have toolkits, um, certainly from um, a number of the uh, major groups and other stakeholders that will help you to understand the process of the VNRs. Um, and from my own organization, Action for Sustainable Development, we also have a little bit of resource which we will make available to help to deliver some training and in some cases help to support convening at the national level around the VNRs. So that's definitely something we can follow up with. And if you are able to indicate which country you're in, we can also link you up with others who are active in that country. Um, secondly, on the expression of interest. So I, I've added that link in the chat um, and I'll make sure to send it again as well um, in the email. So it's, a, it's an online form um, that you just need to fill in um, and you'll see, I'll put it back into the chat again because I know that things move along quite quickly in the chat, but if you click on the link that's in the chat now, you'll see it takes you to an online form. Um, in fact, I might even be able to share the screen um, to show yeah. you. I uh, can see. I can you see. Yeah. Excellent. So when you fill that in, yeah, this is this is what the form will look like. You'll be able to simply add your details. We have it in English, French, uh, Spanish, and also Russian. Um, you just need to add your details, your organization, um, and a little, uh, well, the background of which of the stakeholder groups you're involved with and the country. And then at the end, we have asked if there's a few uh, key areas that you might want to mention that you think will be relevant for um, for the statement on the VNR. So it's not a very long form. Um, hopefully, it wouldn't take you more than 10 minutes or so to fill in. Um, that form, once you fill it in, as I said earlier, we will then, as the VNR task group, we will then contact those who are active in each country and begin to uh, convene meetings uh, with those who are active in each country to then jointly prepare a statement. Um, that's that's the process that we'll go through over the, the coming months between now and, and May. Great, great. Thanks for clarification. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you so much. And the next person who has raised her hand is also very active on this, uh, Sylvia Beals, who is actually one of the members of the VNR task group and I know um, is actively looking at the countries in Europe. Um, Sylvia, welcome, over to you. Hi, thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Great, uh, well, thank you very much. Excellent presentations, Tonya and Oli, and it's great to see so many questions. As Oli explained, I am part of the Global VNR Task Group in representation of the region of UNECE, uh, I'm part of the regional coordination mechanism there. And uh, the UNEC is a very large region, which includes Canada. And I can see a, a question from Canada, but also Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which has uh, put a question up. So it's great to see that. I just want to um, please encourage you, if you have not done so yet, please fill in the form which Ollie has shared, because this will enable us to get in touch with you, uh, those of us in the VNR uh, working group for our region and globally, um, to sort of just support the process that you will go through to come up with a statement as described by Ollie, um, which should reflect the interests of the different constituencies the different major groups and other stakeholders of the of your region, but it should also serve as a means by which, you know, you can go forward to uh, sort of be in touch with the v with the SDG process as it develops in your country. 
and be part of the, the national discussions. I just want to say here that the, the statement is really important as has been expressed, but it's also really important that it's not just a statement, that you come together to work together to, uh, you know, be uh, an accountable mechanism to your government. I mean, your government is accountable to you as citizens as to how it's getting on with the STG process. So it doesn't just stop there. It's a kind of, you know, it, it's an ongoing process. And for, for countries who have reported once, twice, three times, then there's all, it's also important to look at what you've already said, as Oli has explained. So please do get involved. Uh, it will only work with your involvement and we're here to support. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, and thank you for everything that you've been doing already to help to connect people in the region. Um, and as you say, those of you who are on this call who have already identified the country that you're active in, we'll make sure that you are um, in contact with the relevant uh, member of, of the task group who's helping to look uh, to, to support the drafting in, in each region. Um, so there are different colleagues responsible for each region. So thanks again, uh, Sylvia. Um, I see the next person who has a hand raised is Hua Son. Hua Son, um, you should be able to unmute now. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Olive and, and Sonia, for a wonderful presentation regarding the uh, stakeholder participations in the VNR, uh, as well as the amplified and expounded upon by Sylvia regarding the, I, I saw the survey, I probably would, would definitely join the survey group. Uh, however, my, my, my participants and uh, participation and questioning regarding the, uh, uh, the, the, the indigenous group where, where a, a member state nation doesn't recognize that group as the indigenous people, and there's an outside representation represent that group and how, does that group outside the stakeholder as the stakeholder for the indigenous group participate actively and in person in the VNR process? Thank you for the for the, the answer. Thank you so much, um, Hua, Hua Son. Um, just so that I understood correctly, do you mean that if it's an indigenous people's group that may span more than one country and therefore they're across the border and so whether they're still able to contribute to VNR was was that the question well the question is you know there's a member state who doesn't recognize a group as indigenous people and and there's an outside representation outside the member state represent that group how does the outside representation representative uh, be, be actively involved in the in the VNR of that member state? Um, I don't know, Tonya, if you have a, a thought on this. Sure, it, it's a very good question and it's a very relevant question. Um, it's a difficult question to answer because it definitely depends on the member state and the group. Of course, not all groups are willing or um, to work together or, or easy to work with. I, I know that there have been you know, many historical uh, difficulties with indigenous groups and the member states that are, um, you know, that are connected with them. So, I mean, I think that it's important to go through organizations that advocate for your particular indigenous group and not being left behind. Sometimes it's more effective to work with other indigenous groups that are um, working together. You know, we also have at the United Nations, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which provides a platform for these types of difficult questions to, to be resolved. Um, that's specifically focused on indigenous groups and member states and their relationship with one another. For the VNRs in particular, um, you know, if you cannot work with the focal points in the government ministries, um, then perhaps you might be able to work with other types of groups on the ground that advocate for a specific issue. For example, agriculture, biodiversity, uh, youth, 
or women in, in that regard, and then uh, to be recognized as the indigenous groups that you, that you are through these different pathways. Um, I don't know if that is helpful, but again, it really depends on the context of the situation. And if you wish to write to us, then perhaps we could provide some more specific guidance. Um, we can reach out to you and, and try to help you connect with groups that can support you uh, on, on a bilateral basis. So thank you for reaching out. This is really important. And we, and we appreciate your engagement very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tonya. Um, I might just add one small additional point um, that might also help you, um, Hua Son, which is that from the point of view of the major groups and other stakeholders, um, I'm sure you're also familiar that there is um, the Indigenous Peoples uh, major group, um, and that group is very active um, and also aims to provide um, support specifically for Indigenous Peoples' voices to be heard. Um, and one final thing I would say is that when it comes to the VNR statement by uh, major groups and other stakeholders, we do make it clear in the form that I've mentioned, the uh, expression of interest form, that if um, a group would rather keep their identity confidential, um, please make that clear on the form. Um, we know that there may be some situations where groups uh, don't want to be identified by their government um, and that they would like to make um, some inputs uh, in writing, but, but not to be recognized or to be um, uh, included, um, you know, in to have their identity revealed. So if you can make that clear, um, we'll also make sure that, you know, any inputs that come in that way um, in writing can be included, even if um, groups uh, prefer not to uh, have their identity um, made known. Does that is that uh, does that answer your your questions, Hwasan, or anything yeah, else? Yeah, that that yeah, that that will help. That will help a lot. Thank you very much for the information. Wonderful. Thank you again, and thank you so much for your engagement. Um, so we have two more questions, and and time is running out. And I know that um, we won't uh, be able to keep Tonya much beyond the hour. Um, so let me come next to Richard, and then finally after that, uh, Serevuth uh, Prak. Um, so Richard Kamohanda, please, you you should be able to unmute yourself now. Please go ahead. Richard Kamohanda, do you hear us? Um, I'm afraid you have to unmute yourself. I'm not able to do that. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Otherwise, we'll go to Serevuth uh, Prak, please. We also have you now. If you can unmute yourself. Please go ahead. Yes, I have two questions, two short questions. The first one. How can we obtain the video meeting right now? Because uh, we want to review it and can uh, you know, provide that uh, report to our indigenous people from from the the Tumatra indigenous people in the Mekong Delta. So we you know we can explain more. Yeah, the one hour conference that you just provided right now. Yeah, and second question regarding the uh, uh, participant for the government of Vietnam. And we are the Khmer Krom indigenous people in the Mekong Delta in Southern Vietnam. And for the uh, government of Vietnam, they, most of the time, they send the organized uh, NGO, they call Gongo, a lot of them to represent indigenous. But those uh, Gongo do not represent the interests of our Khmer Krom indigenous people in the Mekong Delta. They represent the interests of the government. No, just like a clown or puppet. So uh, it's very difficult for our Khmer Kampuchea Crown Federation, KKF, to, to provide input because, uh, you know, most of them, they probably share a lot of times. And sometimes uh, what we have, the, the, the reality in the Mekong Delta did not, uh, you know, get into the ear of uh, the main 
main uh, like uh, HLPF. Yeah, that's why I just want to know how could we provide us the effective way to provide the input from the real indigenous people instead of through the uh, the uh, Vietnamese uh, organized gongo like that. Thank you. I think that's a very, very good point. Also, thank you, Sedevuth. Uh, I think it builds on some of the points that Hua Son has also mentioned. Um, and uh, what I would say, as I, as I mentioned in the presentation earlier, is that while um, member states are, of course, entitled to bring um, participants um, that they may choose to bring, um, but they have no choice over the speaker from the stakeholder side. So uh, when it comes to that stakeholder speaker that we mentioned, that would be self-selecting. And so if there are um, groups, for example, that you work with in the Mekong Delta who would want to bring their voices into that process, then please, please do encourage them to fill in um, the form that I mentioned for the expression of interest and we'll make sure that those voices and those views can be included as part of the statement from the major groups and other stakeholders. I mean, that's that principle of independence is, is very important to us. So we completely agree with you on, on ensuring that those independent voices can be heard. Um, let me pass back to Tonya, uh, both on this point and any other concluding remarks that you would like to make, Tonya. Thanks, Ali. And yes, I, I wanted to just add that um, apart from the BNR presentations at the HLPF, as I mentioned, we have other sessions as well. And uh, these focus on different thematic areas, including the goals under review for this year, for example, water, uh, energy, cities, you know. Uh, so there are other opportunities as well for indigenous voices to be heard because we always select uh, discussants within each session that represent your voices. So I would say one way to work around the, you know, the constraints of, of speaking directly to a VNR member state within the VNR presentations is that there are other opportunities where you can provide an intervention to make a statement to the forum through one of the other sessions that deal with these thematic issues. Um, and there is in fact one session that is dedicated uh, for the voices of civil society in particular, and that is led by the coordination mechanism of major groups and other stakeholders. And we facilitate that session, but it's it's really focused on all these things that that major groups and other stakeholders need to say and want to say. And it's really uh, wide open for you to decide how to say those things. So, that's just another opportunity at the HLPF for you to make your voice heard. If you feel like the possibility of speaking up during the VNR presentation isn't going to work or for whatever reason isn't uh, the most effective, we can try to make sure that you're represented in one of the other opportunities, one of the other entry points as we call them at the HLPF. So thank you very much. And uh, this is a great opportunity to hear some of the concerns that you have and to, to, to hear your questions. And I also just wanted to note in the chat box, I know there are some participants here that are wondering, I guess with the sign up form, their country is not there. That only means that that particular country is not presenting a VNR this year. Um, all countries have presented at least one VNR, at least most countries have. For example, in the Africa region, 53 out of 54 have presented already. I would encourage countries that want to be involved in the VNR, but their, their, their country is not preparing a VNR this year to still try to become involved. And the regional forums that are happening over the next weeks are a great opportunity for stakeholders to be involved and to connect with member states um, you know, at, a, at a more informal level. I mean, the regional forums are very big. Uh, for example, the Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development is happening next week, and there is a stakeholder workshop and a VNR workshop that run in parallel on Monday, the 27th of February. And then at the end of that day, there's a town hall that merges the stakeholders and the member states. And this is a hybrid meeting, so it's, it's easier for you to access it if you are 
you know, in Uganda or Cameroon or wherever you are, um, please do reach out to us or look at our website or just Google the Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. You'll be able to register, you'll be able to participate virtually and interact with other stakeholders and with member states about when are they preparing a VNR or did they prepare a VNR, let's say last year, for example, 21 African countries presented their VNRs last year, but that doesn't mean the work has stopped. So through the regional forums, through the stakeholder workshops that are connected to them and the VNR workshops, it's just another opportunity for you to engage. And then if your country is going to prepare and present a VNR in 2024, for example, I know Kenya is probably uh, on the list of those interested, then you can go ahead and, and get involved through the regional forums and uh, prepare yourselves for next year. So that's it from my side. And I wanted to say thank you to everyone again for your interest and involvement in all aspects of sustainable development work. And I wish you all a wonderful day, evening, wherever you are. Thanks, Holly. Thank you so much, Tanya. And thank you for your time and for your uh, dedication and for really giving detailed answers to all the questions that we've had today. I think we've had a very rich discussion. Um, I've been trying to add in the chat as you were talking the links, um, for example, to those regional forums. So for those of you who are interested, it's all available on the HLPF website and you can then find each of the regional forums. Um, and also a reminder for those of you who might be interested, we have a similar session to this tomorrow in French at the same time. And then next Tuesday uh, at the same time, it'll be in Spanish. Um, so for those of you who are interested, um, and if you have colleagues who would prefer to see this content in French or Spanish, then please let them know. Um, and we will be in touch. We'll send an email with all of the links that we've mentioned today, with the recording and with the expression of interest form, please do sign up on that form. As Sylvia and others have said, that's the way that we know who's active in each country and we can make sure to start to connect people up over the coming weeks. Um, and we look forward to working with you between now and May to develop those joint statements um, that can then be taken on to the HLPF in July. So thank you once more and uh, look forward to keeping in touch. All the best.